Welcome to the Green Room. My name is Wayne Stetsky. I'm a member of the board of the Symphony of the Kootenays, and I'm pleased to host this, the last episode of the Meet the Performers series. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, BC Arts Council, Columbia Basin Trust, and the many volunteers and musicians that make the Symphony of the Kootenays such a success. We are very excited to announce that after more than a year away from the stage that we will be performing a fantastic concert in both Cranbrook and Nelson this October. Check out our website, SOTK.ca, for more information about upcoming performances and to get caught up on all the exciting things we've been up to. The tables have turned, (laughs) and now we are going to deal with our music and artistic director, Jeff Farragher, as we get geared up for the start of what will be another exciting season. Jeff, it is so nice to be here. It's such a pleasure to host this last episode. Yeah, thank you, Wayne. It's great to have you here, and welcome to our home, and uh, thanks for being in the area. You've been a busy guy. Just uh, maybe quickly let everyone know why you happen to be in Nelson this weekend. Well, I had the pleasure of being your Member of Parliament from 2015 to 2019, and I liked working for you so much, Jeff, (laughs) that I want to go back to work for you again in the upcoming federal election. Well, absolutely. Wishing you the best of luck in that endeavor. Thank you. Yeah, so... um, yeah, it's great to have you here, and it's it's kind of a little bit interesting not only to be on the other side of this uh, interrogation, so to speak, that I've had the opportunity of of doing for everybody, but also to be doing it live. How special is that? All of every single episode up until now has had every musician in a different city or a different place. So it's been so wonderful to hear from all of the amazing musicians that make up the Symphony of the Kootenays. But it's been a difficult year. So how has the last year and and a half or so been for you, Jeff? Yeah, it's it's been um, obviously it's had a lot. It's brought a lot of difficulty professionally for musicians uh, all across the gambit. Uh, I, all, you know, teaching had to go online, which uh, which w- presented its own challenges. Uh, teaching, which is a main staple of most of our uh, careers, and so we all had to adjust to that. And students, and but it's amazing to see how people were so quick to adjust and adapt. Uh, losing the ability to perform, uh, at least in the way we were used to and comfortable with and trained for so many years to do, uh, that was the hardest thing, at least that I noticed, um, not being able to engage with people in this way, in that live way. Um, you know, everybody started to sort of scramble and adapt and started to create online presences, uh, online performances and things like that. But it certainly brought a lot of challenges, and not everyone had the technical know-how or the or the just literally owned right. the gear that was required for that. So, I saw that happening around. Uh, for me personally, um, besides being very saddened not to be able to express myself through my livelihood, uh, it gave me an opportunity to really collect myself, uh, pare down on all of the extra things that I was doing and sort of had to do to keep a career like mine alive. It allowed me to move home. It allowed me to just focus on family and uh, and not spend so much time and, frankly, money on gas. <laughs> it was quite amazing to see uh, the uh, financial situation adjust that way. So um, I, as people that know me, know that I've spent so many years on the road. Um, I went from averaging about forty to 50,000 kilometers a year, uh, and I've, I've barely done 2,000 in the last two years. So... It's been quite a change, but it's been nice, and it was kind of, it kind of took such a major momentous thing to sort of uh, encourage that shift. So it's, it's been good. It's been good. I know it's been hard. Of course, um, my father, who's still with us, he's 87. We've been very mm-hmm. careful about uh, the, the health situation for him. And so, right. you know, we've been pretty, pretty secluded here, but, uh, you know, it's not a bad place to hunker down. So it's been good. No, it's a spectacular place. You know, for me, I've said for a long time that it's the addition of arts and music that turns a community to live in into a livable community. And so I so much appreciate the work that you and the symphony have done to enrich our lives over the years. And I understand we have an enrichment of a musical selection coming from you. Right, that's right. I thought it would be a great way to start the program. Um, you know, the the musical journey with the cello uh, started long before uh, J.S. Bach even existed, but he really did something monumentous for the instrument by creating uh, a six full dance suites for the cello in a time when the cello was uh, 
really considered mainly a bass instrument in the band. And so he did this for solo cello and really brought the instrument to the forefront as a solo, uh, showed, uh, showed the other composers and everyone else what the cello could do. And the very first piece in this whole set of suites is probably the most famous and one of the most well-known works for the entire cello repertoire, and that's the G major prelude uh, by J.S. Bach. Well, you're an amazing conductor and you're also an amazing musician, so really looking forward to hearing this and seeing it. was wonderful and of course music has been your life so tell us a little bit about your musical background your musical journey and how you ended up where you are today yeah so certainly most any professional musician especially but even amateurs that really dedicate a lot of time to the craft will say the same thing that you know music you just you can't not uh you were drawn to it from a very young age and it was always there in your life sometimes we come and go to music but it's always there and that is, that is true. I think, you know, it's our calling. For me, um, it really ha played an important role, not only um, for my uh, career, but also just for my development as a human being. So uh, I, when I was uh, just a three-month-old baby, I was um, unfortunately very severely burned. Um, there were uh, third-degree burns over 70% of my body. And wow. uh, this happened in Cold Lake in 1980. Um, of course, we don't have the same technology back then as we do now. And really, at that time, it would have been considered a death sentence. And so um, as the situation developed, I actually wasn't brought to hospital for a week after this event happened. And so uh, when I was finally brought into the hospital, for whatever reason, at that point, uh, I was immediately air, air to Edmonton, where... 
uh, you know, the stars aligned and a wonderful young up and coming plastic surgeon was, uh, had just begun working there and actually developed quite a few new procedures like right there on the spot to, to wow. save my life. So that, that was sort of my, uh, trial by fire, if you will, at the very beginnings of my life. Um, and as tragic as that was, or certainly could have been, it actually turned out to be quite an amazing event for me in my life because as it happened, uh, my, my adopted parents uh, had just moved to Edmonton recently. And my mom, who used to be a nurse, uh, was volunteering at the hospital as a rocker mom. And each night, uh, so the story goes, uh, I would not stop screaming unless she was rocking. She was the only person. And I guess uh, she used to always tell me that under all of my bandages and everything else, all she could see were my blue eyes. And there was one night where she just, I don't even think she asked anyone. She just took me home. <laughs> Nowadays, I think you get in a bit of trouble for that. But uh, they went through all the, the proper channels and, and filed for an adoption. And, and luckily for me, I have had uh, an amazing life because of that. My parents are, just have been 100% behind me and wonderful and gave me every opportunity. So that's why I look at that whole situation as really the best thing that could have happened to me because I have afforded all the opportunities because of their kindness bringing me into their family. So um, at a very young age, of course, lots of surgeries and physiotherapy. The doctors one time told my mom, you know, don't expect uh, Jeff to really even be able to hold a pencil. That'll probably be too much. So I had, of course, scars on my hands and had to wear gloves. I spent much of my childhood in, in really tight garments and cast things. And my mom, for anyone that knew her, would know that uh, when you tell her something can't be done, it will be done. And so she just, I, she always told me, she said poppycock to them, and that was her expression. And so um, at about the age of four, she consulted a friend of hers about using music as a part of my, you know, therapy or uh, education. And so she put me into the Kodai Early Music uh, program, right. which is a fantastic thing. And um, so getting to learn how to play percussion instruments, sing and dance, and just have fun, like kind of integrating music in a fun way. You know, at the same time, at the age of four, when many of my colleagues were beginning on their instruments, um, I just was sort of taught to have fun with music, which I think was really important. And then uh, through that program, um, my mom met a, met a, call, uh, or a, uh, a teacher, uh, Bonnie Anderson, who... Uh, recommended a cello teacher for me when my mom was looking for an instrument to specialize on. My mom was a French horn player, and so she always loved the cello. I think there's a lot of similarities there in terms of the timbre and the voicing. So uh, she connected me, um, brought me to this fantastic Suzuki cello teacher in Edmonton, Diana Nuttall, who uh, was so fantastic with kids, really good, you know, getting kids set up. And so she was my first cello teacher. And uh, I think she always had the same attitude as my mom's. There's, there's, there's no can't, you know, you just have to figure out a way. And so through the years, I've had to adapt the way I play the cello a little bit to make it work for my body and for, but it's, it was so important to have that, that thing to strive for and also the thing to succeed on and set me apart from, you know, my other, kid, other friends when they could run around on the soccer field and, and I wasn't able to do that at a certain point, uh, I always had my music, so... Right for a very young age, you know, everyone's bio starts with so-and-so started the instrument at so-and-so age. And that's sort of why I started at that age. And I think it was really, uh, just really ingrained the importance and the uh, foundation of music in my life. So I uh, studied cello all, all coming up all through school and uh, also studied a few other instruments, took some interest in drums and, uh, and then decided to go to University of Alberta and do a music major in performance. Uh, I had the opportunity of playing with a really great string quartet. We were there on scholarship. We got to play with the symphony. We got to Edmonton Symphony as students. We got to uh, solo. We got to play with Anton Querti. We got to play a piece he had dug up, he had found, and uh, some really neat opportunities there. Um, at the time, I was also studying then with uh, the professor of cello there, Tanya Prohaska, who happens to be the mother of two of my very dear friends. Uh, that I grew up with as well, and so that was neat. And um, she was a formidable, amazing woman, a wonderful teacher, and just one of one of Canada's top players. Actually, I really it was amazing to have that opportunity to study with her there. And um, and then after the University of Alberta, I moved on to uh, do a master's degree at McGill, and that unto itself was an amazing experience coming from 
Edmonton, living there my whole life, uh, getting to go to a much larger city, a much, uh, you know, really musically rich, culturally rich place like that. And um, I studied with Brian Manker there, who was, uh, it still is actually the principal cellist of the OSM. And um, after that, moved back and started, started my professional career in Edmonton um, by teaching at the Alberta College uh, and be, being the department head of strings there for several years, as well as teaching through the Edmonton Public School System. They had an amazingly vibrant strings program uh, that they ran for years and years, and I got the opportunity to not only to teach cello, but conduct the orchestras there, and uh, just fabulous time that we had there. You know, it's truly an amazing story of hope and perseverance, it really is. So, so let's hear another piece. What are you going to play for us now? Well, since my mom was such a huge influence, obviously, as, as moms are in all of our lives, but really, truly for me, um, music would not have happened without her. Uh, pushing me and encouraging me every step of the way. I thought I would play uh, The Swan. This was, I think, her favorite piece for the cello. Nice. So you're an amazing classical musician, and you play a cello, and, and cello can make people cry, quite frankly. <laughs> uh, I've been there. I've seen my granddaughter uh, do that, actually, in one of the concerts at City, at the uh, Key City Theatre. Uh, but you also have some non-classical influences in your life, something that can make you dance. That's right, yeah. So uh, during my time at McGill, I was exposed to lots of different musical influences. McGill's known for having arguably Canada's top jazz uh, program. And so there was a lot of crossover between the classical and jazz side. You know, anytime a, a jazz musician was going to put on a performance or make a record, especially with string players, they'd dip into the classical program. And, and, and uh, as soon as I heard this was happening, I made myself known because I've always loved pretty much all styles of music and getting the opportunity to improvise and and be a part of that creative process was big there so I, got, I had the opportunity of playing with some really great musicians playing some really unique shows um, getting to play on CBC television and things like that through uh, some of the players there really turned me on to that 
style of music. Um, and so I sort of cut my teeth as a as an improvisatory player, as a cellist that could play jazz or pop or just kind of either play charts or just make things up as we go. And, and so I started that. And then after moving to back to Edmonton, following my degree in, in Montreal, uh, a colleague of mine uh, who I hadn't seen or played with for years uh, called me up. It was kind of out of the blue. She said, uh, hey, Jeff, do you ever play Celtic music? And I had to admit, no, I'd never played a single thing of Celtic music. Um, and she said, well, the cellist I normally work with uh, just moved away. She's just up and left. And I've got this CD release concert coming out in a few months. And you should come and play on the, play on the show. And, and I said, oh, well, sure. How hard can it be? And um, so I came out. This is uh, Carrie Lynn Zwicker, who has actually performed with us uh, as a soloist. Right. Uh, heart, wonderful singer and harp player and she encouraged me to do it and I came out and I got onto stage for this we really just had a dress rehearsal on the show and I come onto stage and around so I'm surrounded by 18 I think of of sort of north northern Alberta's most seasoned folk musicians and there I am on my cello just going you know what do I do and so um, I said, you know, when am I going to get some music? And she said, definitely, there's music. And she plopped down some loose leaf papers with a bunch of letters on them. <laughs> and I assumed, okay, these are the chords, great, but no bar, not, not even bar lines or anything. Sorry, Carrie, I'm, I'm giving away secrets. But uh, and she said, well, yeah, those are the chords. Just follow that along. And and I, you know, had it was a fight or flight moment, you know, where you go, can I do this? Can I make a fool of myself, or can I just find a way of blending in, adding something? But I don't, you know. If, Usually, as a performer, we want to present ourselves, but I had to learn to just blend in and be a part of this really amazing group. And it was a really amazing experience getting to perform on stage, uh, doing this music. And, and something really spoke to me, like that style of music, the sort of fun, upbeat, for driving forward rhythms uh, of, of those you know, jigs and reels, the classic ones, but all sorts of different styles of music. It really got me excited. And so then... I started playing with them more, and we formed a, a trio, actually. We toured for many years all throughout Western Canada, uh, a flute player, Carrie and myself, and, uh, and then started learning about some bluegrass cellists and uh, sort of watching what they were doing, people coming out of Berkeley. Uh, at the time, you know, it was kind of cutting edge, having the cello be sort of this crossover instrument of being able to play, you know, bluegrass chops or... Uh, Celtic fiddle tunes or all that kind of stuff. And um, not to say for a second that I invented any of these techniques, but it was kind of discovering them on my own. And then I would see someone else doing them and I'd be like, oh, yeah. I mean, this was back in, you know, the early 2000s when the internet wasn't what it is today and you can just find anything just like that. Um, so, yeah, I really got turned on by Celtic music. And so that was a big influence. And uh, then I started touring, performing with other bands. Um, our symphony members will know that I... Uh, perform with the Sultans of String anytime they're out here. And uh, that came about in a similar way. I was performing up at the Caslow Jazz Fest one summer, and they were as well. And they happened to come by the stage when we were doing our set. And Chris McCool said, hey, aren't you the guy that's conducting us next year with the symphony? I was like, yeah. And we, we met, and then he invited me out for a jam. And it's how these relationships start, right? And then uh, every time they come out west, uh, Chris calls me up and said, hey, you want to come on tour? And I think he also likes that we have a 15-passenger van, and I know my way around the mountains. But <laughs> uh, So yeah, just being able to play alternative styles and bring a classical sensitivity to it, you know, that I think you know, you, a lot of people will train specifically in that genre. Um, and that's great. They get amazing skills, and they get very natural at it. They know a lot of things, certainly more than I do about that genre. But bringing a classical element in, uh, sensitivity, dynamic, uh, you know, trying to create conversations through music, uh, the way we communicate, the way we play themes or things back and forth. I think that's unique, and I think that, that adds a lot to, to both elements. So um, I've been teaching Celtic cello, if you will, uh, for several summers through the Fiddleworks uh, camps that happened on the West Coast. Uh, last year was the first year that didn't happen. Uh, of course, and so, um, but it's been really fun just getting to to sort of in the summer let loose and, and do that kind of thing. So now I'm a bit confused. Are we doing a Celtic cello or a fiddle tune, or are they the same thing? Well, there's really very little Celtic cello music ever written. Um, now, of course, people that do scholarship in this field will argue that the cello actually does have quite a large uh, role to play in traditional Celtic music. But as a solo piece, uh, you know, fiddle tunes 
uh, there, there's, there's no real rep, uh, repertoire for the instrument. So we either adapt it or we accompany it. Uh, and the idea of adapting it and playing these tunes on cello is, it has, brings its own challenge because we don't have an E string or an octave lower than the fiddle. And the cello is physically larger and there's more real estate to get around, so it's a little more difficult that way. But it just, it, there again is the challenge, and so it makes it a little more fun for me. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to uh, play just a quick fiddle set here. All right, my toes are already tapping. <laughs> So we live in one of the most beautiful areas anywhere in the world, uh, but it has its challenges if you are a musician and you're traveling. Uh, we have mountain passes, we have lakes. So tell us a bit about the challenges of being a musician here in the Kootenays. Yeah, um, like you said, most people move to this area because they've visited, they've, they've seen the beauty, they've met the people. It's a, it's a wonderful place. Uh, but as, as you said, it does, it does bring its challenges. When you're living in a city, you have such a dense population um, so that, say only 10% of the population goes for classical music. Well, in a city of a million people, that's still quite a lot of people that you, you have to draw from. Mm -hmm. um, but in a city of 10,000, you're getting a lot less uh, to draw from. And so in a place like Nelson or Cranbrook or a lot of these Kootenays towns, um, there's still a lot of activity artistically happening, mm -hmm, and absolutely. sometimes I think that does saturate the the uh, the audience that we have, and so it's it that 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 is one of the challenges there, and so trying to create uh, really interesting uh, content or performances, I think that's one of the big challenges we have. Um, also, just people are more spread out here, so you know we're, we're in the city if you've got a wedding you can you can advertise as a wedding quartet and mm -hmm. no questions asked even if your violinist is engaged for something else that day you got 10 other people in your in your contact list uh however here you know there's there's very there's far fewer uh professional musicians that you can call upon so that is also one of the challenges and so right. what that really and those two things combined really um create a bit more of a regional approach that I've always taken not just because I live in Nelson, I need to perform in Nelson and do everything I do in Nelson and only work with people that live in Nelson or, or this region, this area. Um, I consider working with someone in Invermere that's maybe three or four hours away to be my local area. And that, so that, of course, adds travel time, makes rehearsal a little more difficult. Um, but we've always kind of looked at it that way. And so it changes the way we rehearse. It's the same reason the symphony doesn't get to meet every week or we don't get to start rehearsal on Tuesday for a performance weekend like some of the other larger uh, interior BC orchestras have the opportunity of doing. You know, we have, we're drawing people that are driving five, six, seven, eight hours from away. And so if we have to make it compact, we can meet Friday afternoon, 
performing Saturday, like rehearse, rehearse, get it done. So it just, you have to adapt a lot with that. Um, and then really trying to develop uh, contacts and a bit of a following in a lot of little places as opposed to one large place. That also uh, is an interesting challenge because by the time you traverse from Nelson all the way to Cranbrook or even further east into Fernie, you're really gone quite far away from your home community. So you either have to travel frequently and make those make those uh, connections, as you well know when you're when you you're this is what you're doing, right? You're 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 saying t you can represent a huge region of pretty varying different communities uh, over quite a large distance. So you're having to tour around as well, right? And and really make sure, make your face and and what you your what you want to what you want to be doing known. So that's one of the big challenges. And and of course in the summer it's lovely the thought of driving up to Kimberley for a couple of days like we did this past uh, week this summer. Um, you know no no big deal. But when it gets to be October, November, December, and all through the winter, uh, whether it's for symphony, I, I certainly know in those months Ellen doesn't get a lot of sleep coming up to our concerts because. She doesn't know if people aren't going to make it, if we're going to have a big snowstorm. Um, but even just as a traveling musician on your own, I've, I had a big CD release concert where at the top of the Kootenai Pass, the transmission went on my car. And so you're by yourself, you know, you're in the middle of nowhere. And uh, it, it just takes a lot of, uh, <laughs> takes a lot of adapt, being able to adapt and um, just go with the punches because, you know, things have to be a little more uh, loose. Like, I think that's where that lesson of perseverance you learned as a child uh, comes through for you even today. Yeah. <laughs> it takes perseverance to be a musician in the Kootenays yes. in the wintertime, absolutely. Agreed, yeah. For sure. So as I said earlier, you're an amazing conductor, but you're also an amazing cellist. So tell us a little bit. Most musicians seem to have a story about uh, their instrument. Do you have one you'd like to share with us today? Yeah, um, so I'm so fortunate to have uh, a really lovely instrument. And, you know, I have my, my, again, my parents to thank for that, being able to uh, purchase that for me at a quite a young age. Um, you know, I've talked a lot about my mom. Uh, I also just want to share a little bit about my dad, how supportive he's been as well. Uh, the two of them together, you know, it's just so amazing. Um, my dad was always super supportive. He wasn't a musician. He still isn't. Uh, he knows it's not his... Uh, his wheelhouse, but he loves the music that, that I play. He loves coming to concerts. He really enjoys the, uh, the things we do. And he's been, always been such a supporter of mine and really encouraging me to uh, just develop in my craft. And, you know, every step of the way, it's been wonderful. So he, um, he was a woodworker, and, and he still is. He still builds. Uh, we built most of this property uh, together, mm -hmm. and he's built all the, all the furniture and cabinetry. It's really oh. wonderful. And... I always wanted him to build me a cello. I thought that would be really special. But anyone that knows anything about instrument making, you know that uh, it's it really it's one thing to make an instrument, and and my dad always knew he could make it look good. But he knew that the sound would be a different story. You just don't know if you're not experienced in that. So um, we we drove all over Western Canada to find my first full size cello, which was a nice, good first cello. Um, you know, better than, than most had, I think, at that time. And uh, that was quite an adventure. And that was, you know, my dad packing us up and driving us all up and down the West Coast. We actually went all the way from Victoria down to Portland, in fact, where we found the wow. instrument uh, back in 1996. And I played on that cello for about four or five years. And then when I was in university, um, it was becoming evident that I needed a serious professional instrument if I was going to go that next step. And so um, very fortunate to have had the contact of my teacher, Tanya Brahaska at the time, who, um, her brother-in-law, who is a very famous cellist, world cellist, uh, Raphael Walsh, had an instrument by the sort of young up-and-coming maker in Germany, Wolfgang Schnabel, whose father had been a cello maker for years, or violin maker for years, and, um, Wolfgang had made this beautiful instrument that, that Raphael Walsh had played on for many years, and then it somehow ended up in Edmonton uh, with, a, with a colleague of mine there, a younger student of Tanya's. And Tanya saw this instrument and was just like, wow, this guy's really good. And so she actually started commissioning him to come and make instruments for her students. So I believe mine was the fourth cello in the line. Basically, he'd come, take an, take an order, go back to Germany. The next year, he'd bring the cello with, he'd fly here himself with the cello, set it all up, and then take an order for the next one. And would do that 
year after year. Um, and in fact, my good friend and colleague, Olivia Walsh, who plays in the Okanagan Symphony, has the older sibling to my cello. Um, and it was really neat. So at the time I was playing on one of Tanya's Colin Irving cellos, a really fine cello maker, and I was in love with that instrument. It was my favorite cello I'd ever played. Uh, and so I basically said to him, we, he took me out for Mexican food, and we, we chatted about cellos and just to get a sense of what I wanted. And, he, and I said, basically, I love this Colin Irving. He, I played it for him. He played it a little bit. And he's like, yeah, this, he knew the model. It was a Strad model. So he's like, yeah, I think I can make this pretty close. And what was really neat was, you know, throughout the year, he'd phone me and he'd, he'd let me know of the progress. He mailed, this was back before, you know, email was prevalent. He would just mail me photographs of the wood that he'd picked out. They, he, they have tons of wood and he'd pull it out and knock on it. And yeah, that's the piece for this. And so he'd send, you know, pictures once it was cut out and, and, um, and he'd chat, we'd chat about different characteristics. It was really wonderful. But what was really special, um, you know, coming back to my burns, when I was, when I was 18, uh, I had my final round of surgeries, you know, as, as, as full grown as I was going to get. So they released the skin graft so that, you know, any, there wouldn't be any further stretching. And being 18, looking ahead at that surgery, I thought, ah, it's not going to be a big deal. No big deal, right? I used to do lots of these, and the doctors kind of said, yeah, you'll be in the hospital for about a week, and... But a month later, you'll be pretty much back. Okay, I can do this. Well, <laughs> it was a big deal. It was a really big deal. And I ended up being in hospital for two weeks and really had to learn how to walk again. And uh, so there was a lot of, it was, it was a really challenging time being in the hospital. But I, I had a lovely support. My family, of course, was there every day. And I had some really amazing friends who came. Um, one particular night, I was in a really dark place, and my friend had visited that day, and he brought a CD of John Tavener's Protecting Veil. And I had, hadn't really listened to it. It's a contemporary piece. I wasn't really into that kind of stuff at that time. I put it on, and I have to say it saved me that night. It was just this beautiful piece for solo cello and, and string orchestra. And so that really got kind of turned the corner for me. I was kind of heading down a dark path, being stuck in hospital, immobile. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to make the most of this time here. I'm going to learn Dvorak Cello Concerto while I'm stuck here in the bed. And then, um, and then, of course, I'm going, you know, and so I got the music and I would just read it and listen and listen. And I listened to many different recordings. And then it was so cool. I got out, finally got out of hospital and was doing rehab and starting to, you know, be able to play again. And like picking up a cello just felt like this alien thing. Um, and then, of course, Wolfgang came. He arrived. Like, about two weeks after I got out, so we brought this brand new cello, which was like an infant. They really are. When it's brand new, it's like it doesn't have a voice yet. It just sort of doesn't really know what to do. And so I played on it, and I actually had a brand new bow as well. It was a beautiful bow by Calgary bow maker Roy Quaid. And I was learning to play again. The cello was learning to speak. And it was just this beautiful creation of, of newness and being able to sort of start again um, with the knowledge. And luckily, uh, I shed the bad habits because I literally just said, okay, I'm going to start with a C major scale. I'm just going to open strings. And for a couple of days, I just opened strings. And then I started with really simple scales. And so I worked the cello at the same time as I worked my body. And um, so, yes, my cello was a lovely instrument. It's a great, great, great instrument for me. But the fact that we developed together, uh, you know, was the coolest thing ever. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, having that opportunity was really special. And again, it came from you know, a difficult time, if you will, but it really created uh, a different outlook on, on how to play. Uh, everything I did from that point was to come from a place of relaxation as opposed to trying to play the cello. I just came from, you know, this old, realizing how intimate it is. You're holding this instrument. It's, it's touching you. You're feeling the vibrations. You're creating this movement. So long story short, uh, the cello and I sort of learned to play together at the same time. What a nice story. Yeah. Kind of like a love story. Indeed. <laughs> Yeah, and I love the concept of sibling cellos. Yeah, I yeah. How many siblings they have now around the yeah, world. Yeah, well, there were three of us, and then actually, my cellos. I just discovered this about five or six years ago. One of my students here in Nelson um, bought a, a Schnabel cello, and it's the father's cello, so it's like an uncle. Wow. You know, that's kind of <laughs> kind of cool. Well, so what an interesting way to look at it. Yeah, exciting way to look at it too. Indeed. So do you have another? piece you want to do for us. Yes, yeah, so I thought it would be really uh, fun to play some 
of the excerpt from the concerto, which I did learn while sitting in hospital bed, and that's the Dvorak cello concerto. And in our last episode, I got to play a little excerpt of the second movement with our horn players, because there was such a lovely chorale in there. I thought I would actually play uh, from that spot all the way out to the end of the piece, because it is such a lovely work. And I actually did a little bit of recording magic and filled in, in a couple other parts to make it fill out a little bit. I had the opportunity of performing this with our Symphony of the Kootenays back in, I think it was 2010. Uh, and that was that was one of the highlights of my career, getting to play not only my favorite cello concerto, but getting to play it with an orchestra. So uh, I thought that'd be an appropriate thing to present today. Thank you. Forward to it. You bet. <laughs> So near the end of the uh, last part of our conversation, you talked about playing for the symphony, but then there's a journey that led you to become the conductor for the symphony. I'd really like to hear that story. Absolutely. That is sort of why we're here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, of course, I studied cello with various different teachers throughout the years, um, not only at universities, but I went off to summer camps as well. Um, a really important moment for me was when I got to perform with the National Youth Orchestra of Canada. I got to do two tours with them. We did a cross Canada tour, which was 
just mind blowing, performing, I think, 25 concerts in 27 days or something all the way across the country, which was really special. Also got to tour Europe. Um, and so one of the really special things about that is that they bring in world-class conductors to work with the orchestra. So the first summer I got to work with Mario Bernardi, who is well known for um, you know, bringing orchestras together, like bringing them up. Um, he's, he's often brought into places, or was brought into places um, that sort of needed to bring cohesiveness to the orchestra. And uh, he, he was amazing at that with the symphony uh, or with the, the National Youth Orchestra. And so I learned a lot from him there. Um, and then the next year, we read a very special opportunity to work under the, under the baton of um, Kazuyoshi Akiyama. And that was really amazing. This technique of conducting the, just the way the orchestra just gravitated towards his gestures. So I started wondering, why is this so powerful? You know, what is it about these, these people that are able to command such a man? And these, orchestra, these particular orchestras had 100 plus people in them. Uh, and just inspire, you know, respect and, 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 and not only just respect, but like people wanted to do their best for this amazing musician that brought everybody together. And so I really got intri intrigued by that, by that power. It's almost a, like a magical power. And then following that at the U University of Alberta, like I said, I got to perform with the Edmonton Symphony a few times. And of course, um, at the time was uh, Gregor Novak, who uh, we got to play, play under his baton as well, which I, I just found it so inspiring. It's the, the crispness and preciseness of following a conductor like that. And so throughout the years, um, I've had the opportunity of playing under these amazing people, and I just always loved that idea. So. I started taking courses uh, throughout my university career in conducting. Um, another influential conductor who I did get to study with as well as play under for years and years is Michael Massey in Edmonton. He's still conducting the Edmonton Youth Orchestra. There, there, are, there are generations of cellists that are a whole generation older than myself that had him as their conductor when they were in the Youth Orchestra. Wow. And he's still there. I got the opportunity to, to teach uh, the cello sections in Banff at the Youth Orchestra Symposium. And he was still there. It was so great to see him. I'd talk about conducting with him and, uh, and share that. So throughout the years, as I mentioned, I've had the opportunity of, of playing under these great conductors. And then when I was at uh, U of A, but more so at McGill, where I really started to take an interest in conducting. And uh, Alexis Hauser was the conductor of the orchestra there, and I was, uh, had the opportunity of, of studying under him while I was there in orchestral conducting. And I also conducted uh, a strings technique class. We had a string orchestra of our, of our own. That I worked with. Um, I worked with a couple other ensembles there professionally uh, after graduating before moving back to Edmonton. And so it just sort of one thing led to another. I started, was started conducting students, then I started conducting colleagues, and then, um, you know, at the University of Alberta, I got the opportunity uh, for a year of being the TA of their symphony orchestra and conducting them as well, which was really, uh, that connecting the full orchestra was such a fantastic opportunity there. And so, um, we moved here in 2007, and that was a year after I had, I had started a DMA in music at the University of Alberta as conducting as a minor there. And I had some amazing experiences there, but this was, this was now my eighth year of, of post-secondary education. I was maybe getting a little burnt out from it, but also seeing... You know, as a doctoral student, you see the more of the um, sort of bureaucratic side of university life, um, and seeing the, the the a lot of constraints that are placed on post secondary institutions, especially music departments within, because music departments are funny things. They're we have the conservatory tradition, and we try to take these conservatories and wedge them into these big educational institutions, and it's not always a great fit. So I just found for myself to try and. Uh, fit that mold. It didn't work out very well. And so, and my, my teacher in Montreal put it well. He said, Jeff, you know, orchestras and playing in a symphony as well as uh, playing, like teaching at a university, it's kind of a dog, doggy dog world. He said, Jeff, you're a cat. <laughs> so, you know, he's, there was always an advice that stuck with me. I think it's good to know your strengths and, and know your, uh, what, your, what your drawbacks are. And so, anyways, I, I withdrew from the DMA program and actually took a year to sort of assess what I wanted to do professionally. 
which led me into studying an MBA at the University of Alberta. I took a total left turn and thought, well, I was, thought, you know, no matter what career I end up pursuing and continuing with, having business skills doesn't hurt. So, For sure. Yep. So that was that. And then we moved here in the middle of my, of my MBA. And I took a year off. We built our house and sort of didn't touch cello really for a year, which was kind of crazy for me. But I was always listening to symphonic music. And then I got to know when I stumbled into Wendy Herbison here and Nelson, our paths crossed at some point. And she's like, oh, there's a cellist in the Kootenays. Hey, you want to come and play with the symphony? And I never expected there to be a symphony in this mm-hmm. It was so wonderful to, to, to discover that. My first weekend I came out, I actually stayed with you. I don't know if you remember that. But um, that was back, I think you were the, de- the department head of parks, was it, for yep. Cranbrook? Yeah, for, for the Kootenays. For the whole Kootenay region, yeah. right. And it was amazing because I, I will I'll never forget that weekend. I was sort of still not a fully back into musician mode. I was really loving living here and swinging a hammer by day and riding my mountain bike in the evenings. And I actually came with my mountain bike. And you saw it on the roof and decided to take me on a tour of, of the community forest, I believe, right? And that was a really special, I'll never forget that. It was kind of neat. And that was one of my most endearing moments of that weekend. Not only did I enjoy getting to play with the symphony again, meeting wonderful people, but just the fact that I got billeted by this amazing family mm-hmm. who took such an interest in me. And I thought, wow, this is, this is in, this, that really opened the door for me. I thought, okay, this is, there's something here. And so I came back and I started coming back and then I got to play perf- principal cello with the symphony and that went on for a few years and it was just wonderful and then of course we had a financial crisis and the symphony took a year off and a new uh, some new board members some board members stayed on some new board members came came together and decided to shake things up a bit you know let's have a music director that that is from this area and uh, just have a new face of the orchestra and so they phoned me up and i was actually a out swinging my hammer, building a playhouse for my kids. And the call came in, and the president asked at the time, it was Steen Jorgensen, he said, hey, Jeff, we're thinking about someone new f- as music director for the, for the orchestra. And my assumption was that he was phoning me to ask for some suggestions. You know, I know colleagues, right. sure. And then he said, well, we we're actually thinking about you. What do you think? And I was kind of, oh, wow. I mean, just at the time, if it had been four years earlier, uh, it would have been like, okay, yeah, this makes this is part of a progression. This makes sense. But at that time, it was just so not on my radar. And uh, after meeting with the board and thinking about it more and creating a creating a vision for that, I just thought this is a really great opportunity. And I liked the idea that there was there was new direction happening, new energies. You know, we have such an amazing board, and some of the board members have been there since before I was involved, even as a cellist. And that's amazing. Um, it's amazing they've stuck through so many, you know, uh, so many years of ups and downs. It's wonderful. And it's also wonderful to see new, new faces on the board, like yourself and, and some other people as well. And so I just got excited by that, you know, new energy and drive and jumped in, just jumped in the deep end full, full, full tilt. And it's been uh, almost 10 years now that we've wow. been doing that. So yeah. it's, it is the, it's the highlight of my career. It's, uh, those four concerts or five concerts when we're lucky enough to do them are definitely my, my, my favorite weekends of the year musically. It's so wonderful to get together. The symphony, the symphony of the Kootenays, any symphony I play with, I go play with the Okanagan once in a while. I played with orchestras in Calgary, the Kamloops. They're wonderful. They're all wonderful. But there's something really uniquely special about the, the combination of, of humans that we bring together to play uh, on our weekends. And that's always just so wonderful. So it really is fantastic, and I think uh, I think I've developed as a as a musician, developed as a conductor, and I, I think the orchestra has really uh, come along on that journey as well. You know, when you mentioned at the start about the the power of uh, conducting an orchestra, uh, when we were auctioning your baton, <laughs> uh, I got to turn to the orchestra and wave the baton. Uh, it was magical; like it it was powerful. So absolutely, I, I was amazed. I just kind of looked at the baton and said, "This is quite amazing." So you're absolutely right. There, there's yeah, a power there that it really is special. Special for sure. Yeah. So we're very fortunate, and that I think we're going to get to hear at least one more piece. Yeah. So I think we started this whole presentation with a bit of Bach. I'd like to come back to Bach. Um, it's it's funny. This really speaks to the evolution of of music in someone's life. 
uh, the, the reason I decided to go into this as a career is because I realized getting to study under some cello teachers that were at the time in their 70s and 80s that this is something we can do until the day we die. We don't have to be like an elite athlete who, you know, has mm -hmm. their prime. And, uh, you know, even, even if it's just through teaching, which, again, you learn so much from, uh, this is something that will sustain me for, for life. And so it's interesting, um, coming back to Bach again, uh, the dance suites are, are composed of a prelude followed by uh, dances uh, from, you know, French and German dances. So we have a, an allemande, a courant, and then a saraband, then a pair of dances, a minuet or berets, and then they're always followed up by a jig. And of all these dances, I've always loved all of them, but I always found the alamans a bit of a peculiar thing, and it's because it's a long, dead uh, dance form. Um, but then I stumbled upon the third suite, C major suite, one of the more popular ones as well. And the alamand in that one just turned a corner for me. I discovered the beauty of, uh, and just simplicity of this type of a dance. And so it actually ends up being my favorite of all of the movements in the entire <laughs> series of suites. So I thought I'd play this, the Alamon from the C major suite. All right. Wonderful. <laughs> I mentioned earlier that we have a wonderful board and of course Symphony of the Kootenays is well recognized as being a symphony in some of the least populated parts of Canada. Uh, so uh, we absolutely have had a magnificent board but we're always looking for people that have a passion for the symphony. And w when you sit in the theater you can see the passion that people have for classical music and for the symphony. So. Absolutely, if there are people there who are interested in getting involved, uh, we have a spot for you on the board. So we're the symphony from the uh, smallest community potentially in Canada, but we have a giant for a conductor <laughs> and a board. And, and I really want to thank you for sharing your very personal story with us today. It was a great story to hear. And again, I just want to thank you for who you are and for what you do for classical music in the Kootenays. Thanks, Wayne. Well, it's been a real pleasure, uh, you know, to be working with such great board members like yourself and everybody that, um, you know, just so obviously loves this thing. There's no other reason for doing it. And it's amazing to see that. Getting to do these green room presentations has been just a fantastic experience for me, an opportunity to really get to know our players better. And I think that's going to reflect when we get to start playing one together again. So it's been wonderful. And thank you so much for agreeing to come out and doing this so that I could share my story. That's really special for me. My pleasure and looking forward so much to live concert returning to the Kootenays. That's right. You can check out our website at sotk.ca to find out more about our performances and everything we've been up to in the past. Thank you.